Hello, everyone. My name is George Harvey. And this is Tom Fennell. Hello, everyone. And we are which, here. Which one am I looking at? I don't know. <laughs> uh, this one. Here we go. Okay, you got it. <laughs> we are here to give you Energy Week with George Harvey and Tom Fennell. And just as a matter of explanation for anybody who doesn't know, I get up every morning at 4 o'clock and look at the news until about 8. And I do web searches on, um, on uh, news on energy and global warming for a blog that I keep, geoharvey.wordpress.com. I write for Green Energy Times. And between the two of those, I get a pretty good amount of information coming at me. So I feel like I, I can f see trends developing. And I thought I'd share that with you. And Tom was uh, knowledgeable and good enough to be willing to help out on this project and has become invaluable. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with uh, last Friday, and I will bring up to date the news as the most important issues that, that I've had on my blog. If you want to find these, they're on the blog, geoharvey.wordpress.com. And the first thing that comes up here uh, is appeared in the news that I gathered on Friday. Chicago-based Exelon Corporation said on Thursday in a conference call following its quarterly earnings results that it will shut down nuclear plants to save money if it doesn't see a path to steady profits this year. What do we got there? This is what, what, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> this is what's called a glitch. The glitch is what's glitch in the background. Gone. Ah, the glitch that is gone. It came back again. Is that anything like the thrill is gone? <laughs> <laughs> the thrill is gone with nuclear. Well, this, this is one of those plants that uh, is scheduled to be shut down. Yeah. The Byron Nuclear Plant in northwestern Illinois. Yeah, there's a bunch of plants that um, are, are the, the people who are interested in nuclear are kind of expecting that there might be as many as 25 or 30 plants that would be shut off. In the, in the short term. And of course, there's concern about that because what do you replace those plants with, especially considering that most of our, many of our coal burning plants are shutting down at the same time. And That's, it's gonna be an interesting thing to see how that all develops. <laughs> Fortunately, there's can, nobody planning all of this thing from from the top. That's so the way it gonna, looks to it's me. It's going to uh, happen haphazardly. I think that's and correct. And there will be reactions. Yes, I think that's all correct. Although I'll point out that solar can be put in pretty fast. It's not going to come in fast enough. That is enough. very true. Okay, several Caribbean nations committed on Thursday to start replacing their diesel generators, which is the most common means of production of electricity on islands with renewable sources like wind, solar, and geothermal. Um, and this is one of those islands. Oh, good. Isn't Literally. That beautiful? This is uh, Richard Branson's island. Oh, that's Branson's Necker island. Well, he's, he's one of the guys, he's the guy who's really orchestrating He's putting this, this stuff together, yeah. 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 And um, the, one of the things that happens, there, it happens that there have, there's, there have been islands that are now 100% solar in their energy production. There's an island in the Pacific which is called Tokelau. Actually, it's not an island. It's a, it's a small group of islands that form what is called a nation, although it's really protected by New Zealand, as I recall. And um, they are 100% solar, and they're able to live with 100% solar. Yeah. Battery backup, and then in addition to that, for emergencies, they have diesel generators that are running on biodiesel, so it's 100% renewable one way or the other. And there's some islands up in the North Sea that are owned by Denmark that are 100% wind. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting to see how that all moves. And, but of course, it proves that you can do it, which those of us who have lived off grid, which, by the way, does not include myself, um, but those of us who have lived off grid know about that. Um, IKEA's energy program dedicates over $2 billion, three times as much as originally planned, to clean energy investment through 2015. Now that's not even two full years, but uh, it is uh, designed to protect the company from energy price shocks and to tap into customers' green wishes. I have a f suspicion that energy price shock thing is 
pretty important. I think you're right. And we're going to see. Uh, we're going to get later on. I'll be talking about the potential for that. I've got a Kia up on the screen. Now. You have a Kia up on the screen. Look at that. They call it the second largest private commercial solar owner user in the United States. And the largest per square meter of roof, rooftop space. Yeah. Who is the largest? It does. Uh, well, it might have said so, but I, did, <laughs> I didn't copy it down. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. Moving on. Uh, February eighth. A new report from the International Renewable Energy Agency, which is called IRENA, says the renewable in energy industry is responsible for 615,000 jobs in the United States. Mary, many Americans from all political stripes want to see more of it, and that is another one we will also revisit in this broadcast, broadcast, cablecast. Um, another, fr uh, also from uh, Saturday, 2014 looks like it will be an even better year for electric vehicles than 2013. IHS Automotive predicts that the global energy electric vehicle production will increase by 67% in 2014, while global production for vehicles Overall, is forecast to increase only by 3.6%. There's a picture of the Tesla Model S. Oh, good. That's a nice car. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is a nice car. It's a nice car. It is a very nice car. Um, quiet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been reading that they're thinking about putting in some sort of noise maker because these cars are so yeah. quiet, pedestrians can't hear them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. I used to go down to the Northfield Drive-In in my Prius, and of course, standing in line, it would just decide that the it engine was wasn't off, needed. Yeah. And the people who sold tickets down there referred to it as the stealth car, because <laughs> <laughs> it would sneak up on them. But this thing does it all the time. My Prius had, had an engine. You know, it was fun. Getting that car, one of the first things that happened was I was driving up a, a, a very steep hill behind a road vehicle that was going about 10 seven miles an hour, okay? <laughs> and as I was driving up the hill, the engine of the car suddenly decided, or the car suddenly decided that the engine wasn't really necessary, <laughs> so it shut it off. And I was just going up that hill under electric power. It was fun. Okay. Um, <clears throat> next item. India has pledged uh -huh. to build the world's most powerful solar plant with a nominal capacity of 4,000 megawatts. That's big. That's a big plant. Go. I got it. I got it coming up. You got it coming well, up. I don't have a picture of the plant because it hasn't been built yet. Yeah, right. What is but that? Let's, let's see what it, what it says. There. You can read it. Designed to triple the country's solar capacity. Wow. It has pledged to build the world's most powerful solar plant with a nominal capacity of four gigawatts, comparable to that of four full-size nuclear reactors. Well, I... that's, that's peak. Yeah, that's peak. That's peak. Yeah, if you really want to compare it, it's more like... two. No, Certainly I think... One. Well, so, yeah, I would say one. We're talking about India, after all. If it were in Vermont, it would be a small now, here's plant. Here's the important part. This is, this is something that we can relate to. The project will spread over 77 square kilometers of land. What does that mean? Well, that's equivalent to 30 square miles. Three or, by 10 miles. Or 20,000 acres which they say is greater than the island of Manhattan. Well, yeah. for comparison, Brattleboro is 32 square miles. Wow. And how many square miles this is 30. There? So it's the size It's about of, the size of Brattleboro. It's about the size of Brattleboro. <laughs> All of Brattleboro, including the water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and for record, Wyndham County is 800 square miles, the whole county. Okay. And okay. here's a picture, for those that want to see it, of Brattleboro's solar, solar... Oh, goody. <laughs> this one's going up on Technology Drive up near Putney Road. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you can see my my cursor there. That's the I-91. Yeah. Uh, this is Technology Drive. This is the proposed array. As I understand it, the whole lot is 14 acres. This is going to take up 10. Okay. I could be off a little bit there, but I think that's the numbers. Okay. And uh, I spoke to one of the principals here in town that's going to be building it. And they're going to start construction as soon as the weather breaks. And then they're going to finish two weeks later. Well, I think <laughs> it's longer than that. Yeah, but, it probably uh, will be, but it won't be much longer. 
We if may be able to go soon. up there and take a couple of photo shots while they're building it. Oh, that would be and fun. He might be willing to come in here and talk about it. Well, he would be, you know. Yeah. Said, but there's nothing to talk about yet. Yes. You know, so yeah. wait till we get who, something going. Who is that? Uh, I can't remember his name. Ian huh. something or other, I think. Okay. Andy. Andy, Andy K? Andy K. Okay. Yeah, Andy K. That's yeah. who it is. Nice fellow. Um, so this, this or is at least the plan. in my experience, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there is the plant. Yeah, I'll put it back Okay. Up. Next item. Are we ready for the next item? Well. Uh, this is also from Saturday. No, this is something I was going to talk about. Oh, okay. Talk about it. Well, well is this the next item? I don't know. India? I, we're still in India? We're st if, the, if that's India, we're still in India. I can't see very well, so. Okay, I'll bring it up. Is that in India? That's in India. The okay. pumps are... Uh, oh, yeah. Well, that we haven't got to that one yet. haven't got to that no. one yet. No. No, we will get to it, though. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that is very cool. And uh, But le the next item on here is Sumitomo Corporation has developed and installed the world's first large-scale uh, power storage system which utilizes used batteries collected from EVs. I read that. I wasn't able to get a picture of a used battery. These but. batteries for EVs, you know, they're yeah, huge. Huge. And when they are when they are old for the EV and have to be swapped out, they still have they about still sixty have or seventy of percent life. of their useful life. Yeah, yeah. So you can put them in houses to for, for battery Back backup. Uh, off grid houses, for example, battery backup grid tied houses, or for grid storage. And when you think about this Think about, you know, I don't know how many millions of cars there are in the United States, but my bet is it's 150 million or something. I wouldn't bet against it. And, but over 100 million. And if a quarter of our fleet were electric, the batteries in those cars, which are going to get swapped out periodically, would be able to store a huge amount of power. Oh, absolutely. And I mean enough to keep the country going for a long time. Well, and by a long time, I mean hours, not days. Well, this, this right now is a pilot program. Yes, that's and right. There's not enough used batteries out there, there to there make isn't it a enough. practical thing yet. Nevertheless. But that's coming. The, it's coming. The, the, I've been reading that they're saying that the, the EVs are going to be dominating the, uh, the vehicle market by 2020. And personally, I think that's probably very true. Well, one of the big advantages that people aren't really even talking about it yet is the maintenance. The only real significant maintenance cost now is replacing that battery. Yes. You have to do like about every five years or And so. the second most significant is replacing the tires. The tires, <laughs> yeah. No mufflers, no tune-ups, no yeah. carburetors. Yeah. None of that stuff. Yeah. And yeah. people are going to start realizing that. And, of course, the price of batteries is going to go down. Well, there's another thing, too, and, the price, and that is the price of oil is going to go up. And the price of oil is going to get up. And you'll probably, in the not-too-distant future, be able to lease your battery. That's an interesting if, if, point. If they got a, a secondary use for that battery, you can bet that market's going yeah. to pop up. Interesting point. Okay. A new process for creation of gasoline-like fuels from cellulosic plant materials waste materials has been developed by researchers from UC Davis. Cellulosic plant waste is in plentiful supply. You can turn your old lettuce into gasoline. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, here again, it costs two dollars a gallon to get the shale oil out of the ground. Just out of the ground. They and can it's deliver. Still, it's still like tar. Yeah, it's still like tar. It's the worst oil you can get. This stuff they can deliver to market, according to ITRI, for two dollars a gallon. So, yeah. how is the oil industry going to survive? Let's keep going. Um, this is from the ninth. At a cost of eight billion dollars, this is really. This has been in the news for a long time, but it's it's fascinating nonetheless. At the cost of $8 billion, a 3,000 megawatt wind farm is being developed on a cattle ranch in Wyoming. Transmission lines will carry the power to Southern California, and they're expecting to start um, construction in 2015. The, the estimate is that this will save ratepayers in California 
$750 million a year. So an $8, an $8 billion investment by a private enterprise organization that's using that to make money mm -hmm. is going to save people in Southern California $750 million a year. And he's going to be building this in Wyoming? In Wyoming. And yeah, it's a long have a line. a private transmission line. I have no idea how that <laughs> transmission line is going to work. I mean, the state of California is very interested in this project, as you can well, imagine. It's, it's just interesting that this concept exists. You yeah. can generate power in Wyoming, bring it to well, California, you know, and save money. I was talking with a friend of mine who, who said something about a nuclear plant being built possibly on Hudson's Bay. And I said, Hudson's Bay? Why would they build a nuclear plant on Hudson's Bay? Because there's nobody there. There's nobody there. <laughs> he said, for the New York market. Yeah. They want to close Indian Point. They need power. Build a nuclear power plant on Hudson's Bay. And I said to him, um, that's kind of far, isn't it? He said, look at the statistics on transmission. Mm -hmm. So I did. And what I found was that in 1986, the the line loss was eight, was nine and a half percent roughly per thousand miles, mm -hmm. which meant that the greatest distance over which you could transmit AC high voltage mm -hmm. cost effectively was 2,500 miles, mm -hmm. and DC high voltage. Twice that. Four, they said 4,000. Yeah, okay. That was that was with a with a line loss of nine and a half percent, but the line loss had been cut by cut to 6.5% by 1995, okay. which meant much longer. Now, the, the most recent technology uses superconductors, and we're talking about line losses of 2.5% per thousand miles. You could, you, literally, if you had the lines, you could generate power anywhere on Earth mm -hmm. and deliver it to anywhere on Earth cost-effectively. We're pushing the envelope there on a cryogenic stuff. Wow. But it's coming. It's coming. Yeah. And the line loss is low, but you still have to pay to cool the stuff. Yes, it's true. So I think that's where the line loss comes it's from. Coming. Is the is the electricity well, needed? There's almost no line loss. Yeah. And, and, well, you so, approach and the zero. and the two and a half percent is what it takes to keep it at two. It, it might be. Zero. I haven't checked the numbers, yeah. but it might be. But it's coming. Yeah. It's coming. So what they say sounds ridiculous, but it's not. We're we're you know just think about computers. We're in a new world. Think about airplanes. We're in a new world. You know, things are not what they were in 1900. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Okie doke. Biofuel companies rev up while oil co's sputter. What's going on? Aren't biofuels supposed to be dead and fracking changing <laughs> everything forever in gas and oil? Yet public oil companies languish while bellwether renewable fuel equities are on the rise. This is... Um, obviously, a, a piece that was designed to be uh, investment advice. Yeah, I'm that's sure what's the happening. I'm not investors are listening to this stuff anymore. Some of them are. Yeah, some yeah, of them. Yeah, I mean, you look at, you look at that that thing that Ceres organized. Those were investors down there. Twelve trillion dollars worth of investors saying. But they're looking at investing in renewables. They are indeed, and they're looking but, at 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 uh, they. You've got. $12 trillion worth of financial organizations looking at divesting fossil fuels. Yeah. This is a very deal. I think big that's what I would, deal. would lead up to. I think we were saying the same thing, but didn't know it. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's going to be interesting to see how that develops, because I have a feeling that's going to start going big time this year. I okay. think I read the piece that you're talking about. I think it was in Forbes. There have been, there's been a lot about that. Well, I was reading this guy, and I say, what world is he living in? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, everything he said was right 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's part of the problem. It is, yeah. You know, it, it really is part of the problem. Yeah. Okay. Sever now, this is, again, the result of Richard Branson's work, and we were looking a moment ago at the... At the uh, um, at the picture of the of the island, the island in the Caribbean, political there. delegations from several Caribbean islands who gathered at his private isle have committed to working with his renewable energy nonprofit organization and moving at a faster pace to cut their dependence on fossil fuels. This is just more of the same. 
the cost of, of fuel on these islands is excruciatingly high because, because of the transportation that has to be done to get it there. People on, on Hawaii, for example, and, and they're better off than a lot of islands. I got it up again. I could live there with, with, and pay high prices for my <laughs> Well, that's what, I think that's the attitude that people on Hawaii have. Yeah. Know, my parents yeah. lived on Hawaii, uh -huh. and they loved it until, until all the noise. Noise? Yeah, the Japs bombing Pearl Harbor <laughs> woke them up. I would imagine they get on your nerves. Woke, yeah. woke them up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. It was Japs in those days. Today it's yeah, you Japanese. Can't say that you can't say that anymore. I apologize. <laughs> From the depth of my heart, I apologize. And I will probably continue to apologize for the same thing for the rest of my life because that's the way I was raised. Okay, nothing mean about it. Um, and this from the 11th, and this is an interesting article to me. The Louisiana Democratic Party is supporting lawsuits demanding that 97 oil and gas companies pay for damages to the state's marshes that led to coastal wetlands loss and contributed to higher storm surges during hurricanes. I, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't sure understand this, but it sounds like they're asking these guys to pay for damage from Hurricane Katrina. <clears throat> Maybe I should look into this further. Read it again. The Louisiana Democratic Party is su supporting lawsuits demanded, demanding that 97 oil and gas companies pay for damages to the state's marshes that led to coastal wetlands loss and contributed to higher storm surges during hurricanes. That might be drilling that they were doing down there. It's got to be referring to drilling because that's what they're doing down yeah. there. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't quite see the connection. Well, I should look into that further. I didn't really re look into that in depth, and I am remiss. Look ashamed. Huh? Look ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Decommissioning Sellafield Nuclear Power Station in the UK will cost taxpayers at least £70 billion. Pounds. £70 billion pounds is $100 billion. About $100 billion bucks, yeah. Oh, man. That's decommissioning. That's decommissioning. And they're saying here they got a couple hundred million dollars <laughs> and it's going to take care of it? No. Sellafield is, a, is an excruciating problem. Is They've it? had five meltdowns there. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is not a nuclear, a commercial nuclear reactor. This is research. This is military. This oh. is, uh, yeah, this is, yeah. This is, this, this this is, is a where the, different world. This is a different world. This is where the wind scale fire happened. Um, which was at one point one of the worst nuclear things that they that ever took place. And well, we've got stuff like this floating around and nobody ever talks about it. I think that's true. My yeah. sister lives down in South Carolina and there's a uh, station like this nearby. I don't remember the name of it now. Mm -hmm. uh, Savannah River. Savannah River. Savannah River. Yeah. And this is literally true. They have found turtles, snapping turtles, radioactive. Oh, no. Yeah, radioactive, the turtle's radioactive. Oh, well, <clears throat> what's happening in England, in, in England, Sellafield is in England, it's in the UK. A senior men, MPs, that's members of parliament, say what is worse is that the cost is likely to continue going up from 70 billion pounds. But probably lying about the you 70 know, billion. Now. 70 billion pounds, you'd think that they'd have something to do with it, but it could help somebody. Okay, the 12th, the Indian government is aiming to swap out, this is the cool one of India. Yeah. The Indian government is aiming to swap out 26 million fossil fuel powered groundwater pumps for solar powered ones, according here's, to here's Bloomberg. An Indian solar powered pump. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Obviously homemade, but uh, you know, better than lugging that Beautiful. stuff on your by buckets. Yeah, but you know, the, the thing that's lovely about this is just think about removing 26 million fuel, fossil fuel powered engines and yeah. replacing them with something that's like this that doesn't cause trouble. Well, this didn't explain it, but that little blue box there might contain a diesel engine. Oh, okay. Because this is obviously not a new, this isn't something constructed in a factory. By the Indian government. Yeah, it this also is, might contain batteries and a motor. That's what I'm saying, a motor, yeah. Oh, 
You said oh, diesel yeah, engine. Oh, batteries for the solar. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, well, this is this is beautiful. This is beautiful. Kind of a motor. Yeah. Be a, a this is beautiful motor. because India's got terrible problems with pollution. And this is remote off-grid power stations. They're also putting up a lot of solar for the purpose of operating cell phone tower, towers. Yep. And that is what's delivering power to thousands, literally thousands of villages in India even as we speak. But moving on, we now go to Scotland and our favorite um, target. <laughs> Donald, I don't have a picture for, no, for you. No picture of Donald Trump. <laughs> In his latest action to prevent a wind farm from being built off the coast of Aberdeen, within sight of his Scottish golf resort, Donald Trump has once more been rebuffed by a Scottish court. He claimed his human rights were being violated. <laughs> it didn't work. I'm so glad. Of all the goal. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad that Donald Trump is not going to be president of the United States. <laughs> oh well. Um, that is one I, I I really kind of like escaping from. <laughs> now this is important. The United Nations has issued its climate change report probably the most important thing in this broadcast. This concludes that global warming is unequivocal, human influence on the system is clear, and limiting climate change will require substantial and sustained reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. They are saying here. there is no question about it. Yeah. It's us, guys, yeah. and we're doing it, and we got to stop. We can't. We can't keep denying. We it. can't keep denying. I don't know where denying. this picture is, but it's quite pretty. Yeah, it is. But it's might also be very close. Might be Greenland. That that right there looks to me like glaciers. Yeah. 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 Yep. And the this the, pr particular picture came from the article you're quoting. Oh, okay. All right which was in Energy Collective. And you can find it online by going to the blog. and You know, you can click, click on a link to it. Um, I, have a, I have a friend who is a denier, and I don't know that he's still a denier or not after this thing from the UN, but he says the whole thing about global warming is a socialist plot to take the world over by taking over the means of production. <laughs> okay. That's what he says. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> of course, he's, he's in disagreement with 97% of... of uh, no, I, I, I don't want to say he's in disagreement with 97% of scientists. He's in disagreement of 90%, with 90% of the, of the scientists polled who expressed an opinion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a guy last year who did an analysis of 2,500 articles. We talked about this in a previous mm -hmm. broadcast. There was only one person who said that global warming was not happening or, or possibly not. It was happening, but it wasn't, wasn't man-made. Man -made. And he admitted that he had a reason for saying that that had nothing to do with science and everything to do with an admission that it was happening would have serious effects on the Russian economy. I don't know what to say about that. Okay, now this is an article that was an opinion piece that appeared um, yesterday, I think. I've got, a, I've got a note here that's wrong. Yes, yesterday. Amory Lovins wrote this. It is called, Renewables Disruption of the Utility Business Model is a Good Thing. I read that. And yep. he says, renewables were 69% of new capacity added in 2012 in Europe and 49% in the United States. Not surprisingly, this threatens outmoded business models and fossil fuel generation. You know, we've laughed about this in the past, but it, when I read that, I thought to myself, you know, there's going to be people who are hurt by this. Oh, they yeah. really are. Oh, yeah. And a lot of them are perfectly innocent people. Absolutely. At least in the sense that they didn't know that they were doing anything wrong when they hopped into their car and went for a joyride. But in his article, he mentioned that this kind of stuff happens regularly, and he, he mentioned two things, cell phones. Look what it did to the yeah. landline telephone yeah, business. Yeah, absolutely. And photographs. Look what it did to Kodak. Yeah. The, sure the, 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 um, 
You mean the, the film? The, the the uh, digital, pho digital pho photographs photography. eliminated the need for film. Well, certainly computers like this thing have eliminated slide rules, which is something that I deeply regret <laughs> because I loved slide rules. I have a collection of slide rules. I'll, I'll, I'll give free classes. <laughs> I'll give free classes on how to use slide rules to anybody who wants one. I've always loved slide rules ever since I figured out how they worked. <laughs> I read something one time where somebody was talking about a mathematical solution of a problem, and mm. they said they cal that this had to have been done by a stenographer. <laughs> the calculations were, were done with a slide rule, S-L-Y-D-R-O-O-L. Oh, no. <laughs> I'll tell you, though, I have a slide rule somewhere amongst my things. Wipe your chin. <laughs> Wipe my chin? I have a slide rule. Slide rule? <laughs> yeah, wipe my chin. I have a slide rule that was manufactured, believe it or not, in Leningrad during uh -huh. the siege. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Uh -huh. Amazing. Oh, somebody had to make a living there somehow. Okay. Now, this is, co this is very cool. Citing the levelized cost of energy data from the National Renewable Energy Lab, which is a, a part of the DOE, the Department of Energy says that the average price for utility scale PV project dropped from 21 cents per kilowatt hour in 2010 to 11 cents per kilowatt hour at the end of 2013. I got that graph. Oh man, just think about this for a moment. That means that we're, we're on the verge of having utility grade, utility scale PVs at That's a good price. grid parity. We're, we're almost there. We're almost there. And in some parts of the United States, we, we are, are there. there, well past there. I mean, if you, think about the, if you think about Hawaii, we were talking about it earlier. In Hawaii, 21 cents per kilowatt hour is, is like a, 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 a price of power, a wholesale price of power. And that means that they can probably get power from the PVs for half the price of what they of the power they're buying from other from other sources. Well this particular article said they're shooting for six cents. Yeah, and, and I think they're gonna make it. I think so too. You know, it's and and you know the, one of the things that's really fascinating about this is this is this is utility scale uh, PVs. And we're talking about grid parity, which means that it competes with Natural gas, it okay. competes with nuclear, and of course we talked last week about a, a judge in um, in Minnesota who decided that it was going to be PVs that would go in mm -hmm. instead of natural mm -hmm. gas because the PVs were cheaper, mm -hmm. the electricity from the PVs mm -hmm. would be cheaper. What we're what we're at, and I think it's important for people in Vermont to know this. P, the cheapest source of electricity in Vermont, cheaper than grid power is PVs that you buy, or lease. Buy, I think, is better. But you can buy them and put them on your roof. You can buy them and put them in your yard. You can buy them and have them in a community system yeah, that you can, you is can remote. Combine your resources with others. You can buy into right. a co-op. Right. You don't have to be on your house. That's right. And when you do that, your electric bill immediately goes down. Or in other words, the total amount of money you're spending on electricity using such a system is less, and that includes whatever electric bill you have, the cost of the PVs, the cost of, of financing the PVs, it's going to be less than your electric bill typically, mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. always. And of course, the, another very beautiful thing about this is that seven or eight or nine or ten years from now, when the system is paid off, that portion of your electric bill goes to nothing, and you don't have it anymore. I haven't even given that any thought, but yeah. Yeah, isn't that cool? <laughs> and when you have a co-op or something like that, you, you, you can join a co-op as an apartment dweller, mm -hmm. you know, as a, or as a person who, who rents a house. And if you move, you can move your account. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, is, there are so many reasons to do this. Uh, which is one of the reasons why, well, why the the situation with with solar in Vermont is, is and we will get to that. <laughs> well, 
conventional wisdom says that the electricity that you're using is exactly the same electrons that the power company is supplying into the grid. Yeah. And that's no longer true. It's, it's, it's now an accounting thing. Yeah, it's an accounting Hydro thing. Hydro-Quebec can throw electricity into the grid up in northern New Hampshire, and we can suck it out of the grid down here. It's not the same electrons, but they're doing the same work. Yes, that's right. <laughs> It's yeah. sort of like a great big pile of sand. Yeah. Well, this guy's dumping sand in over here. You're taking sand and, out over there. It's not the same sand, but who cares? Well, one of the things that, you know, I, I just wrote a, a several articles for uh, Green Energy Times, which will be coming out in a couple of days. And one of the things on the, on the um, cover was uh, articles about, about renewable uh, res resourced uh, maple sugar farms. And a couple of these farms, they have big PV systems on their yeah. roofs, and they're putting power on the grid during the summer. Okay, they're putting so they're power putting on you the grid, credit. and they're pu they're <laughs> getting credit. And as you said, it's an accounting thing. Yeah. It's not. It doesn't matter where the electrons come from or where they are at any given time. It's an accounting thing. Now, um, you're not. By the way, you're not talking in a in any way about this article I'm going to put up on the screen. Which is that? The right mouse. The one about Vermont? <laughs> this one here. What's that? A perfect storm is coming. Oh, I'm going to get to that one. Okay. I'm I sure. will get to we'll, that. We'll, we'll, we can have that up on the screen when we're talking about it. I will. I'll bring it and, up. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I evidently failed to put an article on here that I intended to put on, but Vermont is now... Oh, no, here it is. Yeah. Um, the Solar Foundation says that Vermont is ranked number one in solar jobs per capita. I saw that. Yeah, I didn't have any pictures to take. So this is so pictures. cool. It's exactly, it's because people can get, and of course, the, the position of Green Mountain Power on this is really nice. Yeah, they're, they're yeah you want to do this? They're supportive. Great. <laughs> that's that's Great. very cool. It's very cool. Not every utility is, is as accommodating as they are. Some of them are fighting it as hard as they can. Green Mountain Power has the advantage of being able to be the good guys, partly because, or at least without any damage to themselves, partly because um, they don't generate power. Well, they generate some. A little a bit, lot. yeah, not but that's lot. not their, their main it's business. It's not their bag. Yeah, but there are, and this is, this is something that almost, I, I hit this and I thought, wow, there's an interesting statistic. There are 1,300 solar jobs in total in installation, manufacturing, and project development. Vermont added 990 solar jobs from 2012 to 2013. 990 of those jobs, of the 1,300 jobs, were added from 2012 to 2013. That means wow. that... Yeah, this, wow. This is some increase. That means they had an over 200% increase. Yeah. That, 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 this is a big deal, you know? <laughs> and, and we can expect that very possibly to continue. Hey, if there's any young people listening to this, yeah. and you're graduating from high school, you're graduating from college, My suggestion, learn solar. Yeah, don't learn go solar. into nuclear engineering. <laughs> <laughs> Learn that's solar. my suggestion. Maybe I'm fact, wrong, folks, but go, go that's work, my suggestion. Go to work for a solar outfit and go to college at night. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. Um, the European Commission has delivered what Greenpeace UK says can only be called a scathing initial verdict on the UK government's deal with the French state-owned EDF to build the first new nuclear reactors in the UK for a generation. These are Hinkley Point C. Yeah, the famous Hinkley Point. Wow. And the, the problem with Hinkley Point, we're talking about two nuclear reactors costing $26 billion. They're going onto the grid for a cost of $1.6 billion, and the only way they could get investors in this was to guarantee double the going price of... of electricity and the only way they could they could get investors even at that price was to open the thing up to people from China who were willing to, to take risks <laughs> and now the the European Commission has is saying well <laughs> you broke a few rules when you did this and of course yeah. the the solar people in Britain are, and the wind people are Britain in Britain are saying you want that power we can give you the power yeah. we can give it to you a whole lot cheaper we can give it to you a whole lot faster and one of the things that's really interesting about solar power, it may be intermittent, but it 
is generated at peak demand times. Well, that's causing the utilities a lot of problems. Oh, too. boy, is it ever. Because they've been selling peak power at a premium. At a premium, and now they can't anymore. <laughs> this is a big problem. Okay, moving on. Should we move on? Why not? Okay. Renewable energy plants constructed in the last 10 years. These are plants that are already built. Mm -hmm. Will save Turkey $5.5 billion in natural gas imports every year for the next 49 years, according to the Turkish energy minister. I now, got, I got, a, a, I you got, got a, a picture of this of, one, yeah. This what is, is that? It's a stadium in Turkey. Oh, goody. And <laughs> it is net zero. It generates more electricity than it uses. Oh. And as you can see, they light it up quite well. Yeah, I suppose they do. Nice work, Tom. That's a good one. Yeah, it, it has. To, I'll read what it says in case you can't yeah. see it there. Yeah. Vodafone, that's a telephone company in Europe. Yeah. It's like the Verizon of Europe. Yeah. In Istanbul, the Vodafone Arena. They, they name arenas after companies over there. Yeah. How strange, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> In Istanbul, as many innovations such as solar energy production from photovoltaic transparent plates, you can see through them. Isn't that cool? It also has the ability to collect rainwater to use and has ozone friendly gases for air conditioning systems. Cool. The stadium is expected to produce 500 kilowatts of electricity, roughly equal to the capacity of 100 houses, to supply its own energy needs and will market the excess in production for profit. <laughs> Amazing. That's a nice that, looking stadium, isn't it? Is it is, yeah, it is. You know, I'm trying to figure <coughs> out how much of that roof you could sort of see that there's a roof there, and I think that's the solar panels. It might be because it says they're transparent. Yeah, it might which be. Which is the, the latest thing. Well, about. you know, they, they can put solar panels on cloth now. Yeah. And that being the case, maybe they could put them on plastic, and you could actually have that roof in an inflated thing like a greenhouse, and have have the whole thing covered with solar panels. Well, I see no reason why not. <laughs> and I haven't seen that yet on the internet. But, well, uh, you never know what's going to real quick. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've got enough patents. I don't need patents. I've got three patents, and I haven't made a dime on them yet. <laughs> okay. Um, legendary hedge fund investor Jeremy Grantham says there is no doubt that solar and wind energy will completely replace coal and gas across the globe. It's just a matter of when, he says. The question is only whether it takes 30 years or 70 years. And folks, I will tell you, I think he's wrong. It's going to be less. <laughs> it's going to be less. <laughs> it's going to be less. <laughs> okay, now, this is the thing that Tom was talking about earlier, and Tom, you could put that up tomorrow. tomorrow's news today, and unfortunately, the version of it that you, you got has broken lines, so it's got 10 items where there's only supposed to be... That. Oh, okay. did you? Wow. You know, Let's there's two people here, one of whom is competent and the other is not. <laughs> <laughs> Tom is competent. I'm all flash and well, funk. No, I'm not competent because I can't find the... Uh... <laughs> we'll get it. There it is. We'll get it up. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. All right. I, wrote... anyway, I, got a, I got a hunch you know who wrote this. <laughs> You know, what's funny about this is I wrote this article for Green Energy Times. As I, as I mentioned, it's coming out in a couple of days. And I submitted the article, okay? And two days later, I, um, one of the European banks issued a, uh, a statement basically saying a perfect storm is coming for the American utilities. And they used the same, not all of the same bullet points that I have here, but they basically agreed with them. So well, I think it makes it's sense. nice to have my analysis of this thing. Read them off, talk yeah. about them. Well, the first is, and the first is actually two parts. Fossil fuels are in, facing increasingly strong competition in a contracting market. Mm -hmm. The market is contracting. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> they didn't know how badly the market was contracting until last year. They did an analysis of the numbers that had to do with um, efficiency for the first time in 2013, they figured out how much money was invested in, in efficiency in 2010. And they were shocked to discover that in the United States, the amount of money that was invested in, in efficiency was the same, roughly, as the amount of money that was invest, invested in fossil fuels. 
Okay. Which means, and of course, efficiency is the low-hanging fruit. Yeah. For every dollar you put into efficiency is going to is going to cut more than much more than a dollar yeah. out of the fossil yeah. fuel industry. So the population is going up, productivity is going up, demand for power is going down, and that's why they did that. Well, it happens that also in 2010, the investment in renewable power met the investment in fossil fuels. That's a double whammy. It's a double whammy. The market is getting sh is getting smaller, and you're getting bigger competition in it. That means that your market share is declining in a contracting market. This is really bad. This is really, really bad. Well, this, it's bad for the utilities. Uh, the, for the utilities and the fossil fuels. It's not for, bad not for all us. utilities. Not for <laughs> no, us. Not, Actually, not in Vermont, we're in pretty good shape yeah. here because, because, as we were saying, uh, Green Mountain Power and some of the other uh, Vermont utilities are not basing their power production on fossil fuels. Correct. We have no coal burning plants. Correct. I don't know what we've got in terms of natural gas burning plants, but we don't have a lot of them. I'm not sure there's any of them in Vermont either. I believe the uh, plant up in Burlington is capable of burning natural gas, but that's not their normal. Oh, what do they burn? Wood. Oh, they burn wood. They're probably gasifying the wood. They're not. Oh, they're not. Okay. <laughs> They've got a gasifier installed. And, and they're not using it. I talked to the engineer up there, and he called it a science project. Ah, okay. <laughs> so it's, well, it's still some, there. Some of them can do that. It's still there. Maybe they we can should... do it, but it, it wasn't fit in their, their business model. Yeah. So that it's, I Maybe guess... we should get that and bring it down to Brattleboro. It might be for sale. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this... uh, I was going to say something about uh, Burlington Electric Company. Though. Okay. They just bought a hydro dam. Yes. In Winooski. Yes. And by the time this comes online, which should be about a year, year and a half, they will be 100% renewable. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I read that. Yeah, that's, that's uh, the kind of cool. Okay, number two item in this list is yeah, fossil cool. fuels are seeing customers turn into competitors. Well, wow. You saw Ikea's roof. Ikea's roof, Intel okay. is a big one. Walmart is huge on this. And they're moving along. They're moving along. Google. And yeah. what happens is that these companies put up solar. Now, the solar is, is producing power during the daytime. And, of course, it's going to produce more power than they need during the daytime in order to bank that, those credits so that they can draw them at night. Mm -hmm. So what happens is they're putting the power, the excess that they have, which is probably going to be half the power they produce, on the grid. When they need it most. When they need it most. When the grid needs <laughs> it most, when the highest prices traditionally have been charged for wholesale power. And this is when just knocking the price, yeah. high price of wholesale power. Which is it's not, not a bad thing for anybody but the guy that's selling that power. Exactly. <laughs> and what's happening is you take a company like Intel, which is a huge power user, yeah. And all of a sudden, instead of being the customer that the, you know, the, the utility can say, you guys are great, you, we'll sell you at a, at a slightly lower price than anybody else into Intel is, is beating their best market price, you know, at times. That's basically what this means. That's they, what they it are means. They're turning into their competitors. Okay, fossil fuels are seeing increasing costs while their customers' costs decline. All right, oil shale costs two dollars to bring out of the ground. Just to get it out of the just ground. Just to get it out of the ground. If we could convert to oil shale, what would it ha would happen at uh, entirely? At what pump? would happen at the pump? My guess is 10, 15 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and so, what happens here? Well, you've got uh, as we me as I mentioned earlier, ITRI is marketing a technology that is already developed, that you can put into a plant that is currently making ethanol and modify the plant very slightly, take cellulosic materials, waste materials, wood chips, um, uh, straw, anything you want, you know, um, and you can, you can generate from those um, a material that can be burned instead of gasoline for $2 a gallon at the pump. At the pump. So which are you <laughs> going to buy, two gallons, $2 a gallon for tar in Alberta or $2 a gallon at the pump? 
Now, it's not going to be $2 It a won't gallon. be, but hey, it's still going to be cheaper. It's going to be cheaper. And, you know, they didn't include the, the, the cost of taxes in that. But there's a very interesting thing here. We've been talking about global warming. And this, this cellulosic material, not only is the cellulose, you know, taking, making the cellulose means carbon atoms come out of the air, and you, when you burn it, you're just returning them into the air, which is a cyclic process, which is why they say that the cellul cellulosic fuels are carbon neutral. But the manufacture of the material is said to be, by ITRI, carbon negative. You, they are fixing more carbon, sequestering more carbon, than is released the next time that fuel is burned well, in the we're manufacture. We're seeing the part of the plant that's above the ground, and that's what we're using. There you go. But the roots are still in the ground. That's and right. The carbon that's in the roots stays in the ground. That's right. <laughs> and they're using switchgrass for this, which is a which is a, an, a perennial plant. When the when the grass dies down, you go harvest it. Yeah. And the next year, the plant doesn't care. Again. You know. I was you thinking. You know what? You, you know what you could do this with. This would be fun. You could do it with hops. <laughs> you can't do it with hops, eh? Have you ever seen hops grow? Yeah. Oh, yeah. amazing plants. <laughs> They'll, they'll have vines that go up 18 feet in the air. Yeah. And at the end of the season, they die all the way down to the ground. So they mm -hmm. just grow up. The, and, of course, the hops are valued for making beer. But, yep. but the stalk of the hops plant is just junk. Yeah, yeah. There used to be a hop farm on uh, the road between uh, Williamsville and Dover. Really? It's not there anymore because I was on that road yesterday. Yeah. But, uh, that's interesting. Yeah, it was the, you could see the the strings, the ropes that the pops plants grew up. And yeah, that was a small, maybe a quarter of an acre, maybe less really? even than that. Well, you can get a lot of you can get a lot of hops out of a quarter of an acre. I would imagine, yeah. Yeah, but I, it's not it's not there anymore. When I was young, I bicycled through Kent, um, and went past hops f farms, and miles and miles, and miles and miles of them. And you know, it's interesting because the guys who tend the hops will walk around on stilts. Okay. <laughs> really? You know, they're, they're yeah. 10 feet up that in the air. Sense. But they're walking around on yeah. stilts. Okay. Next item. Fossil fuels are having more trouble getting financing, and at the same time, renewables are finding funding easier. That's an interesting now, development. The World Bank has said, we're not going to loan any more money for mm -hmm. coal. Mm -hmm. My bet, they're going to stop uh, loaning money for for shale oil and fracking and, and materials like that. And by the way, you know, I'm just going to mention here, look at shale oil, all right? They have pulled out of fracking. They're, they're no longer... To. They're, they're divesting from all sorts of stuff. That yeah, they have, they have pulled back from fracking. They've pulled back from shale oil. They've pulled back from Arctic uh, drilling. Mm -hmm. They were going to build a, a gas plant in Louisiana for a couple billion dollars that was they're going to turn back. gas into into uh, liquid fuels. They got rid of that. Um, these people are basically, and, and now yesterday I think I read an article saying that they were really, it, the article wasn't all that clear so I didn't put it in this. They are really going after renewables. Shell is. Chesapeake, which is the second largest fracking company in the United States, is no longer um, uh, doing, looking for new fields. They are no longer drilling. They're only going to take the gas that they've got coming out of the ground. The fracking, $2 a gallon we've been talking about. I've seen projections that it would go to 3 um, The The prices are going up. Meantime, what's happening to the price of renewables? Well, we saw what was happening to the price of solar. But another thing, too, wind turbines. Wind turbines that have already been installed. Last week, 402 I think it was 402. It might have been more than that, but it was over 400, not much over 400. Wind turbines, GE wind turbines, were going to get upgrades. Yeah. yeah. Software we, we upgrades. Yep. Software upgrades. Yep. I don't know. Maybe they distributed these things on CDs, but it was, it was a 10% increase in the amount of power coming out of the wind turbine because of software. Just change the CD. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. What does this do to the fossil fuel industry? Okay, next item. Oh, did you want to say something? I was just going to mention something. But back in, I think, the 80s, when people were just becoming aware of solar. Yeah. And it, it was still very expensive. It was not much very more than a laboratory experience. 
Yeah. The energy companies were heavily buying into solar companies. Yes. And BP inside of a that. period of about five years, these solar companies weren't there anymore. Now, I don't know if the energy companies deliberately closed them or they they weren't seeing you the rate of return like they wanted. Conspiracy what, theory. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what was going on. Yeah. But uh, they're out, they got out of the solar market. Now they seem to be getting back in, getting, which I think is very yeah. appropriate for them to do. I think it is, yeah. Some of them are doing it, others are not. Yeah. And um, this, you know, during the course of this broadcast, I've been thinking about this issue. I know there are going to be people who are saying, solar and wind, you can't do that. They're intermittent power. Yep. And that's the next, that's uh, the next thing, you're thing coming up. About. The old ideas about intermittent power, it turns out they're not right. <laughs> Well, nobody foresaw, and it hasn't happened totally yet, the smart grid. Yeah. Where all of these things are balanced automatically by computers. Yeah. And we have the technology now. Yep. It's in the process of being yep. implemented. That's right. Just because it makes sense. We could buy wind power that's from wind that's blowing in North Dakota. Well, we talked about that before. You know, the, Nobody cares where the electrons are coming from. Exactly. There is a big contract between wind farms in Kansas and the state of Alabama. And, mm -hmm. the, and the electrons are being shipped one at a time to, <laughs> to Alabama. First class mail. <laughs> but another thing that people don't realize is that the old paradigm of power production dating, dates back to the beginning of the, or the first half of the, of the 20th century. Oh, yeah. And the way this works is... J.P. Morgan. Yeah. The power plants are huge in order to take efficiency of, uh, get efficiency of scale. They're built close to the markets, and they're built a little bit bigger than the maximum amount the market will demand. Mm -hmm. But because they're huge, they have to be going flat out all the time. Mm -hmm. At night, when the power prices are low, they have to be going at 100%. Vermont Yankee is like this. You cannot turn it down. Correct. You can turn it down, but it'll take days to get it back. You can't turn it down and take advantage of the next day's uh, peak demand. So you sell power at low prices, sometimes for nothing, sometimes for negative prices at night, in order just to be to able keep going. just to keep getting and, and get those big high prices during the daytime that are being slammed by solar. And in the meantime, wind is coming in. And it's even making the, the nighttime prices lower, so they're typically going negative. And these big power companies are just suffering, which is why Exelon is saying we may have to shut these plants down. Well, mm -hmm. what's the problem? It isn't solar and wind, folks. Mm -hmm. It's the old paradigm. The old model is... is it old. doesn't work. It's very bad match. And in the meantime, as you said, you can have a computer that's... It, the, the problem with wind, too much of it. Too much power when it's designed properly. Mm -hmm. What do you do with too much power? Well, with wind, it's easy. If there's too much power on the grid, you say, turn that turbine off. Turn that turbine off. And the turbines furl, and they stop turning. And well, you don't have too much solution. power anymore. I think the best solution is to save it. But, uh, well, yeah, that would be a good solution. And <laughs> but in fact, until you've got the uh, storage capacity, shut it off. Yeah. But you know, Northfield Mountain storage mm -hmm. capacity, is they can, they can produce more power than Vermont Yankee. Mm -hmm. And it's pump the water up to the top of the hill, let it run back down to the bottom. We've got to do a session on that. We, we have to. Field trip. And the final thing is the political and financial pressures against fossil fuel and nuclear is increasing with compelling reasons to act for action soon. The UN is saying, stop subsidizing these people. Yep. And it's talking to the nations. You're giving $535 billion a year up to $1.9 trillion a year to the fossil fuel companies. Based on what? Why would you be putting that money into them? If you put it into renewables, getting out of, out of the, the, uh, um, the global warming problems that we're in is going to be easy. Mm -hmm. So there you go. You got one more you forgot. One more I forgot? What's that? Even in the transportation sector, fossil fuels are set to lose ground. Absolutely, yeah. We are coming up on the end of the hour, I think. And so I want, to, I want to part with the idea that if, I, I honestly think this is going to, this set of seven things that we have, this is a perfect storm. And what we're going to see, I believe, is that most probably this year, possibly next year or the year after, but most probably this year, we're going to see a meltdown in the, in the um, 
in the fossil fuel and the, and the utilities, and I'm not talking about a nuclear meltdown. I'm talking about something that's going to look more like, meltdown. yeah, it's going to look more like the um, subprime mortgage problems. Oh my God. And it's going to hurt people. <laughs> yeah. People are going to get hurt. And fortunately, people in Vermont are going to get hurt a whole lot less than people mm -hmm. elsewhere because most of our power is coming from renewables. And that having been said, I will say goodbye, folks. <laughs> But I have a feeling that Tom and I are going to stay we'll here for a, stay little here a little while. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're watching a broadcast, you're probably going to, you, this will probably be the end of the show. But if you're not watching a broadcast and watching this streaming on, on the Internet, uh, you may have more delightful material to come. Well, yeah, I was going to mention uh, in the early days of electricity, back in the J.P. Morgan days, the principal sources of power that were coming online were A, hydro, yeah. and B, enormous in size. We're yes. talking Niagara Falls, we're talking yeah. Bonneville, yeah. we're talking TVA. Yeah. The government was getting involved in building huge, huge plants. A little interesting sideline of that, a guy that we all love, know and love named Nikola Tesla, Yes. He was a young kid, <laughs> decided he was going to harness Niagara Falls. He's over there in Yugoslavia. Yes. But everybody knew what Niagara Falls was, you know, yeah. when you went to get married and stuff. Yes, of course. <laughs> it was a world No wonder he place. wanted to hi harness it. <laughs> and he wanted to harness it, for, and he did. He yeah. succeeded. Uh, I forgot the rest of that thread. <laughs> you were talking about Nikola Tesla wanting to do... Well, that, yeah, I said that, the, that much. For the, for the J.P. Morgan and, and stuff. I have a feeling that you're going toward pumping water around. Well, I wasn't. I was just saying that this... that. One of the reasons why the grid developed this model of large generating stations and large transmission lines yeah. was because the, the most accessible source of power at that time was large hydro. Yes. And of course, over the years that has changed. Coal came in and oil eventually came in but and stuff like the that. the coal burning plants depended upon coal that was being delivered by barge and by train. By train, yeah. And so they had to have... dirty coal. Yeah, but they had to have railroad sidings. Yep. So you could conceivably have a coal-burning plant in Brattleboro, but you wouldn't have one, have one in Wilmington. No. You'd have to, you could do it in Brattleboro because we yeah. had railroad siding. Yeah. But well, actually, there were railroads going up to Wilmington. Were there? The entire area in uh, the Sunderland area was, was virgin forest. In the early part of the 20th century, we're talking huge trees. Yeah. Early part of the 20th century, they went up there to exploit that virgin forest. And they ran railroad tracks right up in the middle of nowhere. And wow. the, the paths of the tracks, the, the rails are gone, but the paths of the tracks are still there now, to make interesting walking trails. Yeah, I bet. Are they, but, but are, those must have been narrow gauge Some rail. of them were. And, and they may have all been, but some, definitely some of them were. Yeah, and they would have been steeper than you usually have on... on Not wooden, necessarily. Wooden. A lot of that land's flat. Oh, really? Yeah, a lot of that okay. land's flat. I well, can tell I'm you, I was hiking something. in there one time, in the middle of nowhere, and I found a black rock. <laughs> it was cold. <laughs> what the hell is it doing up here in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> it had, had something to do with the train, so I would expect they to burn wood. Well, it might have been that they were delivering coal to something. Well, there was nothing up there but logging. Yeah. But it was an enormous logging. Uh, they, may, they may have been, when was the logging being done? Early part of the 20th century. See, when I was, when I was a kid living in Illinois, the, the, the trains that went through the town that I lived in were, were steam engines. Mm -hmm. And I can remember watching the firemen in the, in the steam engine of a train that was just starting up at a station, shoveling um, coal mm -hmm. from, from, the, from the, the tender into, mm -hmm. the, into the fire box. And that was an interesting sight, you know, for mm -hmm. a little kid who was six or seven years mm -hmm. old. But they were using coal, and mm -hmm. the, the engines that they were using were old. They mm -hmm. were very old. And I suspect that, you know, the, the engines that you're talking about may have been coal-burning engines, even though they were hauling wood. It's uh, possible. Yeah. Because somebody brought that piece of coal up there. Yeah. Of course, on the other hand, you never know how things are going to get into the woods. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, maybe maybe an eagle brought it up there. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm reminded of... of um, you know, pe people talking about what is the wh what is the likelihood of an event taking place. 
you hear about an event. What's the chance of that? And one of the th principles that I work by is, you know, the the event of a the the likelihood of the the likelihood of something extremely unlikely happening is extremely high. <laughs> Say it again. All right. The likelihood of something ex extremely unlikely happening is extremely high. I'm not specifying <laughs> what's going to happen. That's the trick. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, you yeah. know. Expect the unexpected. Expect the unexpected. Exactly. There, <laughs> I was working on the question of what kinds of happening happenstances can you expect at a nuclear power plant? <clears throat> and this was, of course, before Fukushima Daiichi got de de inundated by a by a, um, a tsunami, which I will say they should have expected. Absolutely, they should have expected that yeah. tsunami. Yeah, but I think so. I was I was doing some work on this. You know what unlikely things happen. A fishing boat, this is actually you know, a large boat, this is a large commercial fishing boat off the coast of Japan sank. And when it sank, they, they put out a distress call and the Japanese National Guard went, picked up the sailors and said, what happened? And they said, the, the boat was hit by a cow. <laughs> expect the unexpected. The cow <laughs> fell out of the sky. Wow. The, the, this what was it doing up there? <laughs> well. I know pigs can fly. Right. <laughs> the, the, the cow fell out of the sky. So the police grab a hold of these guys and say, you guys are lying. We're going to throw you in jail until you tell the truth. And they're sitting around saying, but it was a cow. You know. Well, it turned out that what had happened was they had been in the sea north of Japan in an area where Russian planes would fly around. And a Russian bomber had had a crew that had stolen a cow. <laughs> and they took off with this stolen cow. <laughs> and they got up to an altitude of very high, whatever it was, and the cow went berserk. <laughs> and they decided they had to get rid of it in order to prevent it from destroying the bomber. So they just opened up the bomb and dropped it. <laughs> and the cow sank, sank a boat. And um, <clears throat> expect the unexpected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the thing about the Fukushima Daiichi that I mentioned, by the way, they had a 5.7 meter seawall. And they got... 5.7 meters. 5.7 meters. But the tsunami that That's hit... That's 15 feet. 20, almost 20. Yeah. 5.7, yeah. 18 feet, I think it is. Mm. That seawall got hit by a wave that was 14 meters tall. Oh. And so the wave, nine meters of, of wave, just went over it. Right and of course, a, a tsunami wave is not like a normal breaker. It's, it just keeps coming. And, and it's more like a flash flood where the waters just rise and rise and rise and rise and rise and rise and rise. And it goes on for minutes with the water rising, and then it recedes. So all of a sudden, the ocean height is 15 feet higher. 15 feet higher than the seawall. So, of course, the thing completely flooded. Now, here's the problem. The northeast coast of Japan gets hit by tsunamis periodically. The last really big one, this one, they got hit by short waves. The tallest waves that came ashore were 37 meters. Wow. Now, that same coast got hit by a 27-meter wave in 1933, and by another 37-meter wave in 1896. So when that plant was built, when those reactors that melted down were built, they were being protected by a seawall, and the people who designed that seawall should have known. They should have known that this was possible. That this was possible, and really, they there was... They probably did. Yeah, they probably... And the guy with the bean, count, the bean counter said, we can't spend that kind Exactly, of exactly. And, and so what happens is... <clears throat> You've got the my view of, of how this engineering was done was that the guy who is the bean counter went into a room full of engineers and somebody said, how tall is the seawall going to be? And he said, well, how tall can it be for X amount of money? And they said, oh, mm -hmm. 5.7 meters. That's what we'll do. And, and that is, you know, just horrible engineering. 
horrible engineering. Absolutely. It's in it's it's culpable. Under, un, it's culpable. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. And um, there's a lot of things. I mean, nobody has said this is why it happened, but it's clear when you look at the history of the tsunamis in that area that that was the problem. To me, it's clear. But what what actually happened at at Fukushima? Do you know? Do we know what happened at Fukushima? I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't know whether we know. I think we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> we know that reactors numbers one, two, and three all melted down. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly what that means. Mm -hmm. We know that at least one of them got a hole in it because mm -hmm. we've got radioactive stuff all over the place. We know that buildings one, three, and four all blew up. We know that building one and building four blew up with lateral blasts that were white, white smoke. We know that when building three blew up... What does the white smoke imply? They're saying that that's a hydrogen gas in the building blowing up and it made steam. <clears throat> okay. when, re when, react when building three blew up, it wasn't a lateral blast with white smoke. It was a very powerful vertical blast with black smoke. What does that tell you? I'm not sure. I'm not sure either, <laughs> but I have a guess. The New York Times ran an article on the front page that said fuel fragments had been found a mile and a half from the plant. I have read that. Yeah. Okay. Now, people were saying, oh, no, this really isn't true. Can't happen. Can't, Can't happen. happen. Okay. How could it happen? Um, in July of 2011, and my recollection is, and this is going to tell you something about how my mind works. My recollection is it had to have been July 17th or July 19th, but I don't remember which. And the reason is because I remember it as a number between 15 and 20 that was a prime number. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean about me? I don't know. <laughs> but um, there, was a, there was an NRC conference call. And in the course of that conference call, they were talking about the spent fuel pools, and they said the spent fuel pools all behaved perfectly. Everything at the spent fuel pools happened exactly the way it was supposed to. So Ray Shaddis, who is a, a consultant for the New England Coalition, which is based here I in Brattleboro, I mean, I know of him. asked a question. And his question was, if the spent fuel pools behaved correctly, where did the, the f fuel fragments come from that were found a mile and a half from the plant? He asks embarrassing questions. Yes. Now, you would have expected the guys at the NRC to say, oh, there wasn't any fuel found a mile yeah. and a half from the plant, but that isn't what they said. They said, oh, that fuel couldn't have come from a spent fuel pool. It had too much radioactive iodine in it <laughs> to have come from a spent fuel pool. It was recently in a critical situation. Open mouth and so Oh, my what? gosh. <clears throat> so he said, are you telling me that that was ejected from a reactor? And he was cut off. Wow. Now... <clears throat> we wow. have recordings of that conversation. Mm -hmm. You can hear it. Mm -hmm. If you go to the NRC site and you look at the look at you know you look for Ray Shaddis at about that date, you'll find the the transcript. But the transcript doesn't have all that information in it. Some of it has been yeah. surgically redacted. removed. And well, it wasn't even redacted. They didn't say it's it's there, but we won't tell you <laughs> what it is. They didn't even say they it was just there. They said it wasn't there. So anyway, I. Among the various things that I've done, I have a little bit of a background in, in ballistics, mm -hmm. all right? So I can think, what does it take to get a, a, a piece of nuclear fuel to travel a mile and a half? Well, if it were a 22 caliber bullet from a 22 rimfire rifle, it would leave the, that area at the speed of sound and it would get a little bit over a mile. But the 22 caliber bullet is designed to be ballistically efficient. Mm. What we're talking about is something that's a little bit bigger than a 22 caliber bullet, but it's cylindrical and tumbling. Mm. It's going to have what they call a ballistic coefficient, which is going to be extremely low. My guess is... Similar to a rock. Worse than a rock, worse actually. Worse than a rock. Um, I mean, a rock can be round. This yeah. thing is... It, it, my guess is that, that it would be worse then, uh, you know, these things are about a centimeter, 1.3 centimeters or something in diameter. It would probably lose 
something on the order of 50% of its energy every 10 or 15 or 20 yards. Wow. Okay, that's just a guess. But even if it behaved like a round ball of that size, it would lose half its energy every 100 yards. And in order to travel one, one and a half miles, it had to leave that plant at a speed that was well in excess of the speed of sound. Wow. That requires a big explosion. I would say. Now, right now, they are taking fuel rods out of... Yeah. Spent fuel pool number four, mm -hmm. which was the only spent fuel pool that could have produced that explosion. Mm -hmm. One, two, or three are not damaged. Mm -hmm. If they had an explosion that was able to, to, just in the open, to cast an object a mile and a half at the, at, in excess of the speed of sound, and I'm, I'm guessing not just in excess, but two or three times the speed of sound at least, that, that, the rest of the fuel in that thing would have been in, in a shambles. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be extracting. Mm -hmm. I think that vertical column of black smoke that came out of reactor three happened because the top of the reactor blew off. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's just a guess, but nobody's talking about that. No, they're not. We're not likely to find out in the near future. Well, I, this Until thing... Until something really bad happens and they can't deny it anymore. Or until so much time has gone by that nobody's worried about it anymore. Yeah, well, that could happen. But these things that we have been talking about, <clears throat> the seven items about, the, about the, um, the future of the fossil fuel industry and the, and the utilities that depend on those fossil fuels, I think is another thing that we're not talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when they get into trouble, I think people are going to get hurt. And there's going to be... Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people got hurt in Japan, and uh, they're kind of trying to minimize that. Oh, well, they moved a lot of them around. And, uh... 160,000 people were evacuated, mm -hmm. and very few of them have gone back home. Mm -hmm. Or will ever go back home. Or will ever go back home. And, you know, there's another thing, and maybe I should have had this in the news. <clears throat> the Tokyo elections elected a, a, a candidate who is pro-nuclear, and um, they, for some reason, the American media were saying he was elected by a landslide. And if he was, then the definition of landslide in Japan is different than it is in the United <laughs> States because he only got 30% of the vote. <laughs> but he was running against a wide range of candidates. And the anti-nuclear candidates. I think possibly all of them were yeah, anti-nuclear. Well, two of them got 20% each, mm -hmm. but 20 and 20 and 30 is 70, and yeah. that means 30% of the vote went to the rest of the candidates. The rest, yeah. And But all of the political parties, except for the one that's in power, are anti-nuclear. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be surprised if all of those people weren't anti-nuclear. And the, the, um, that is something also. Um, I don't know what the future of nuclear power is going to be in Japan. I think they'll probably turn a few of those reactors back on again. But, you know, it, it, two, three days ago, right after that election, they were talking about the nuclear side won. Mm -hmm. Today, I'm, I was seeing a thing in the, in the news saying, well, it's a little iffy. <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen there. I'll talk about a link that you put up. What's that? I have sort of copied it down and condensed it. Oh, okay. Eight reasons for optimism. On oh, yeah. Change. Yeah. Now, there's plenty of pessimism about climate change. I'm optimistic about climate change. Well, this gives you eight reasons to justify to, yeah, that. Yeah. And I'll, I, I'll go up, I'll go around them real quick. Yeah, that's a good idea. One of the, the first reasons is we already know how to engineer zero carbon buildings. Isn't that interesting? That's a building, in case you don't figure it out, that generates at least as much energy as it uses. Yes. Like that stadium in Istanbul. Well, there's, there's actually one that was built in a house that was built in Devons, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. that is producing significantly more power than it uses. And the guy who owns the house gets a utility statement every month with a check in it. With a check in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, so... Commercial construction is going to start moving in that direction. Yes, just it is. because it's good economics. That's right. Yeah. The next one, we are finally entering the age of the electric car. Isn't that Been beautiful? around for a long time, and it says here, sales of these vehicles nearly doubled in 2013. 
Yes. And it's on an upward curve. Yes. And as more and more infrastructure pops up where you can recharge them, as more and more people realize, hey, you know, this, this, is, this is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, and I, we've discussed this on the show. I read where people say they're more fun to drive. Yes. <laughs> I remember that. So they're, they're coming. They're coming, and they're going to come, I'd say maybe within 10 years, they're going to be all over the place. I think they're going to be dominating the market. Probably. Absolutely. Okay. And when you consider the the increased prices of fuel that we're anticipating, I think people are going to be bailing. It's only going to go up. Yeah. The low-hanging fruit has been picked. Yes, that's right. Okay, we're using more renewables and less coal than ever before. <laughs> and one of the sub-reasons that I saved this one is we finally learned how to finance renewables. That's a very interesting point. The financing guys <coughs> are getting into it. They're seeing a market. Yeah. And, you know, these are very clever people. They know how to make money. Yeah. And they're finally saying, well, what can we do? What kind of package will we put together that will attract investors in renewables? And it's now starting to get sexy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the next one is interesting. It's, it, it, states are showing that it's possible to make policies that both cut carbon emissions, and create jobs. And they give an a, they give a example here, and I didn't follow up on it, but apparently California, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia, the West Coast, have gotten together on some sort of a plan, and they say it will bring a million new jobs to the region while reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80%. Wow. Well, I didn't check those figures, but they they're sound, certainly going to move in they, that direction. That sounds reasonable. I, I looked at... You know, the the situation in Vermont a couple of years ago, and based on, uh, you know, basing projections just on the numbers I was getting from Europe, the the ultimately the number of people I would expect to be employed in renewables in Vermont would probably be well in excess of 10,000, possibly as much as 30,000. And, um, you know, that's not just wind, solar, but, you know, biomass, biomass efficiency. Efficiency. You know, efficiency is a very big deal, and it's oh, been around absolutely. for a while. But we're going to see this be a, a, a very important. And we saw, what was it, 615,000 uh, nationwide mm -hmm. in the news. Um, this, is a, this is a big deal. And it's the kind of job we in Vermont can do well. Oh, yeah. Local. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. The, we have people that are capable of doing this kind of stuff. Yep. Yeah, it's... I but think it's, it's, it's going to going to help Vermont's economy. Yeah, but it's also the kind of job that people who are being thrown out of work in the coal regions are going for in the same regions yeah. where they can they can set up renewable stuff for, and for be, kind of similar reasons. I mean, yeah. they're, they're kind of the same background of, of, yeah. of people, which is interesting. Yeah. Okay, the next one here, the fifth one: cities are facing the consequences of climate change and taking action. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of cities. They're all doing different things. One thing about cities, though, many cities are built on coastlines. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other... I mean, many many yeah. of our biggest cities yeah. are in danger of getting flooded. Yeah. Boston, well, well, Providence. They're, they're talking more about more here about the cities building new buildings, being solar or building yes. energy efficient right. kind of stuff. Right, right. I can talk right here in Brattleboro, it isn't a city, it's a town, but so what? Uh, the housing authority. Now, I'm a commissioner in the housing authority. Yeah. And you're probably aware that we're in the process of building a new development to take care of the people who we have to move out of Melrose because of the right. flood danger. Right. And as of now, the architect has told us he's going to heat it with wood chips and he's going to have so, some solar on there. Now, it's not going to be a solar building. It isn't big enough. But there probably is enough solar to take care of lighting the common spaces. Yes. So there's going to be a solar array on there. And that's significant. Oh, yeah. It's, just, it's a little thing. Yeah. But this is the kind of thing that cities and towns all can do. Yes. You know, and, and it could move on from here with the housing authority. I mean, we could put well, solar on more of our buildings. My guess is that the state of Vermont sometime in the next, say, six or seven years, is going to pass a law saying that every building that's built has to produce its own energy. Well, that's, that's a far stretch, but it's possible. I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bet against it. I wouldn't bet against it. 
The next one's talking about the Fed. It's, it's, it, it takes the president. So the president is ready to take actions at home and internationally. Yeah. And he cite two things that happened. Uh, talked about the World Bank, and he, the president had nothing directly to do with the World Bank, but it will no longer contribute money to coal-fired power plants that the World Bank is funding. I think you already mentioned that. The World Bank has already said that it's not funding. That's exactly what we're yeah. saying here. And this was something that the U.S. is doing. We're working with China and India to negotiate an agreement to prevent the use of hydrofluorocarbons. I think they got that word wrong. I think it's fluorohydrocarbons. Might be. I'm <laughs> but not these sure. are the propellants in spray cans. Yes. And they're horrible greenhouse gases. They're horrible greenhouse gases. And, uh, they're and finally, they don't go away easily. They, no. And they're, they're finally taking a good look at this and say, how can we eliminate it? And right. they can be eliminated. Right. Uh, on a little sideline here, <laughs> I did this. Uh, I was always a fan of roll-on or rub-on uh, stick mm -hmm. deodorants. And 20 years ago, you could hardly find them. Everything was spray. Yeah. And recently, I was going around looking for a can of spray because I wanted... And you couldn't get it. I could, but it was, there was only one out of about 100, and it was expensive. <laughs> Yeah. I went down to the co-op looking for a spray thing of, yeah, of yeah. aerosol for, for uh, scents in, a, in, a, in, a, in my apartment. Well, that requires energy. You've got to do this. That's right. <laughs> and that's what I found. Yeah, you can get an aerosol, but it's going to be like this, yeah, well, and it, which is fine. You know, it's fine. It's a big improvement. Are, are we so lazy that we can't do this? I know. <laughs> it's really bad <laughs> if we have to do that. It's really bad. But the, that was the conventional wisdom was, you know, when we were kids, I think, at least when I was a kid, if you can get something that, that is thrown away, that's better. Yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. Well, the next one here refers to China, and it says China wants clear, clean air and clean energy. Yeah. And since China is such a large economy now, and it's growing so yep. rapidly, this is big. Yeah. And it's, it's, it explains that. Air pollution from coal-fired coal power plants has become a political liability in China. Yes. And it has, interestingly enough, it's getting that way in India as well. And it is, yes. And they have a lot of coal in China. And they have a lot of coal in India. They're importing it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the Chinese, I think, the Indians have had a lot of trouble getting coal. And the Australians are looking at selling coal to the Indians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They but have a lot of coal. They have a lot of coal. The Indians yeah, have a lot. Of, they don't have a lot of coal, but they have a lot of coal-burning plants. Yeah. And, and Australia has the coal, and it's becoming politically unpopular to use the coal there, although I guess the present administration... The present administration of... The, the present administration is free market. Yeah. And they want to stop subsidizing renewables yeah. because they're free market. But their free market subsidies, they want to have some subsidies left. And specifically, they want subsidies for coal. Yeah, well, you can subsidize <laughs> the uh, fossil fuels, but the, it's bad to subsidize renewables. Well, there's a reason for that. And the reason is, right now, coal doesn't employ as many people, and the investors are in the coal. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get votes from people who, are, who can invest, you subsidize coal. Mm -hmm. And it'll be interesting to see what happens when they figure out that the coal is, is, a, is smaller than the renewables. Because if the Indians decide, and the Chinese, the way I figure it is the Chinese would decide they're not going to burn coal anymore. They're going to ship their coal to India. <laughs> <laughs> and the Indians are going to say, we're not going to burn this. <laughs> and the, the Australians, who don't even have the coal-burning plants, they do, actually. But they do, yeah. They, they, they don't need them. And the final one is very interesting. Renewable energy is on the rise around the world. It Duh, is. I mean, everybody's aware of that. Yeah. But the, the uh, example they give is interesting. Renewable sources will produce more power than natural gas and twice as much as nuclear. This is worldwide now, yeah. 2016. And, and this one here I'm, I'm a little bit doubtful about. Saudi Arabia is building 54,000 megawatts of new renewables. That number's awful high. It's a very high one, but you've got to remember that the... That's 90 Yankees. No, it's not. We talked about this before. Well, the capacity okay. factor... If we're talking about peak. We're talking about peak. 
You have to figure the actual amount. Now, in, in Saudi Arabia, PVs are going to produce a lot of power. They because have a lot of sun. They have a lot I've of sun. There. They have a lot of but, sun. But they're going to be they're going to be twenty five percent or maybe a little bit more, where the nuclear is ninety percent. So you have to figure okay. somewhere between three and four uh, times as much nameplate capacity is going to produce the same so time. Twenty five Yankees. It's about twenty. Yeah, and what they're figuring is they're going to have huge, huge growth in demand because they've still got they'll large. Be They'll be exp they they were they have been looking at this and they've actually said this they have, they have been looking at this as a problem of what do we do when we can't export oil oh yeah they were thinking about that when I lived there yeah and and their answer is well we can export electricity yeah now in order to do that this is might be a, might be a good thing because in order to export the electricity they're going to have to have much more secure surroundings than to export oil. The oil can be exported by ship, and you can fight wars over it. Mm -hmm. We have. But when you're exporting electricity, it's very easy for terrorists or wars or whatever to take down the power lines. Well, they've got pipelines that they have to protect. Yeah. That's not any different, really. Yeah, but the point that I'm making is it's going to be very much in their interest to make sure that these little threads that are running through the, the countryside elevated off the ground stay where they are. And so they're going to start putting, I think, maybe more, in, more attention on the idea of stability. I think they'd be smart to bury them. To bury them? Bury I think. I think you know, we're getting. We're getting. I. Th I think that. I think that when you when you have to protect the the countryside and you yeah. have to protect the population, you get into scenarios where wars become too expensive to yeah. fight. Yeah. And I think you know you look at. You look at Europe, we have not had any expensive wars, wide-scale wars, since the Second World War. We've had a couple of little blips in the Balkans, but... Well, we had Yugoslavia, that was, that was yeah. a little bit more than a little blip. Well, it was, but compared to the, to the, to the Second compared World to War... Compared to World it was, War II, it was, it was nothing. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I think that wh what I'm saying is I think that this, the Saudis and Tunisians, Libyans, you name it. These guys exporting have huge oil. amounts of desert. Yeah. There's nothing there but sand. That's right. And and they can export that electricity to Europe, make money on it, live tolerably well, and at the same time, there isn't a commodity that can be captured. It's something that requires it's not going to have any value unless they can keep it. Oh yeah, you're right. So I, I think that you know, I, we were talking about optimism. I feel pessimistic sometimes, and I feel optimistic sometimes about global warming. I always feel that we're probably going to deal with global warming as a, as a human species, and that our civilization and our society is probably going to continue with some modification. I don't feel optimistic about the environment. Mm -hmm. I think there's going to be a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. But I do think that people in Vermont are going to be healthier and happier 100 years from now than they are now because of the changes that we bring about in order to deal with global warming. The thing that makes me pessimistic is the question of how hard I think that's going to be. When I feel pessimistic about it, I feel like it's going to, be, it's going to hurt to do this. It's well, going it's, to be hard. It, it's going to hurt, but it's going to hurt Vermonters a lot less than it's going to hurt yeah. people in places like Scarsdale. Yeah. When I feel op optimistic about this, I look at it and I say, this is going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're starting a little bit, anyhow, raising consciousness on things about community. Yep. I mean, it, you know, take a look at Postal Law Solutions as an example. Absolutely. That's just one example that we see locally. Transition towns. Yeah, absolutely. Another we're, example. We're starting to think about this kind of <clears throat> yes. stuff. Yes. People are getting together, exchanging ideas. Co-op power. Co-op power. Yeah. Bingo. It just goes on and on and on. Well, I got another thing that I, that I saw here. I, this was, I think, a link to something. Okay. That you, I don't think you talked about this one. Which is but that? I'll bring it up. I'll... Uh, this is a few. This is fusion. Metal oh yes, fusion. Yeah, this isn't that is pretty? fusion fusion, like the stuff they've been working on for 50, 60 years now. Yes, 
and not getting too far. Yeah, let's get it up here. That's the first time I've seen something that looks like a tin can. Yeah. Being used in, in a fusion this, this is called a whole realm in German, which I think means a whole room. <laughs> and it's about the size of a pencil eraser. That? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And it's made of gold. Oh, well. And I'll see if I can get some more information up I there. could take a gold pencil eraser. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what contains the fuel that they're bombarding with lasers to get the deuterium atoms... To and fuse. tritium atoms to fuse and wow. create hydrogen. Wow. And they have just, in the last few days, succeeded in doing it. Yeah. We're using lasers. Yeah. And uh, they're still putting in much more energy than they're getting out. Yeah. But they're actually accomplishing what they want to do. Yeah. Uh, a long time ago, the 70s, I guess, I lived in Princeton. And one of my neighbors worked in a uh, fishing company. Uh, Efficient Energy Corporation, I think it was called. And I remember talking to him about it. And uh, I was saying, what we need is a something like a Manhattan Project to get this going. And he said, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. And he said, all these things have to take their time. They have to take steps one before another. Mm -hmm. and, a, and an immense project wouldn't speed it up sufficiently to justify it. Yeah. And here we are, what, 60 years later, 50 years later, and we're just getting to the point. Although there has been other kinds of fusion, they've never done it with lasers before. I'll read a little bit about this. Yeah, go I'll ahead. Bring it up. This is a metallic case called the Whole Realm. Holds the deuterium tritium fuel capsule. A series of conducts, a series of tests conducted at the NIF. What's NIF? National I don't know. Institute for Fusion, or something. it might be. <laughs> From September through November, scientists used a battery of 192 high-powered lasers to bombard a tiny pellet inside a gold chamber less than an inch long. Inside the pellet was a hair-thin layer of two hydrogen isotopes, deuterium and tritium, chilled to a temperature more than 400 degrees below zero. Well, 50 years ago, we couldn't create 400 degrees below zero. <laughs> Uh, we could get close to it, though. What was it? I have a, I have a story I can tell you, but continue. <laughs> I'll continue on this. Yeah. Uh, the gold converts the laser light. Oh, I know what I was thinking here I wanted to say. In hearing about this on the radio, yeah. it was on uh, New, New Vermont Public Radio. Okay. Night. Hearing about this, for a very, very brief period of time, those lasers were using more energy than the United States was consuming totally. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay, That's crazy. The, gold, the gold converts the laser light into a bath of x-rays, which cause the surface of the capsule to explode. That drives the capsule inward onto itself, an implosion that builds up pressure on the hydrogen isotopes. And again, on the radio... They compared it to compressing a basketball to the size of a grape. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. The pressure compresses the deuterium-tritium mix to a density more than double that found in the center of the sun. Hurricane said, the engineer's name was Hurricane. That's yeah. his last name. That's a real, yeah. real name. <laughs> yeah. Hurricane said then the deuterium, oh, he was, he, okay, Hurricane said the pressure compresses he, it was the end of the last sentence. Yeah. Then the deuterium and tritium fuse into one, releasing neutrons and alpha particles, which are helium atoms yeah. without the electrons. Yeah. And in a seventh of a billionth of a second, it's over. <laughs> However, the most recent experiments produced more helium nuclei, which increased the reaction rate, which produced more alpha particles... Hurricane said. It's, it's that bootstrapping, he said, may lead scientists to eventually produce a reaction that yields more energy than it consumes. Yep. That's their holy grail. Yeah. It sounds very modest that it is, he said, but this is kind of closer than anyone's gotten before, and it's very unique to finally get as much energy out of the fuel as was put into the fuel. Amazing. So we're, we're, getting, we're getting there. 
don't we are. Got I do have another one, uh, another thing here. Uh, building the largest sol solar thermal project in the world. You can see that picture up there. Those are a whole bunch of little mirrors. My and gosh. that's a big column that's about the size of a large chimney. So with our parent company, NRG Energy Incorporated, clever name. Yes. Along with Google, Bright Source Energy, and other investors, we, whoever we is, are building what will be the largest solar thermal project in the world when completed in 2013. So this must exist already. This is Ivan. This is Ivanpah. Ivanpah. We've seen, we've talked about this. Yeah. They're located near Ivanpah, California. Yeah. So these are just different pictures of some pictures we've already seen. Yeah. In the Mojave Desert, the Ivanpah Solar Electric Generating System will generate at least 392 megawatts of electricity, nearly double the amount of commercial solar thermal energy now generated in the United States. The project comprised of three separate plants to be built in phases has begun construction on federal land managed by the Bureau of Land Management and witnessed its first grid sink in fall of 2013. So they're feeding power. Into and it. actually one of, those, one of those things is now at full power. Is it? Yeah. Electricity from Ivanpah will be sold under multiple power purchase agreements, each of 25 to 30 years duration, with Southern California Edison and Pacific Gas an electric company. Now, do you know what the storage time is for this? No, I don't. Yeah, I think it's several hours after the sun goes down, this thing yeah, continues. It, it, yeah, it gets hot. Yeah. They're heating sodium, I think. Yeah. They're melting sodium, yeah. And, and yeah, yeah, it stays hot for a while. Yeah. So it'll, it'll continue it, It's not just when the sun is up. The sun yeah. Is down. yeah. The electricity generated by all three plants is enough to support a yearly average of 140,000 homes and more than twice the, that number when operating at maximum capacity during the peak hours of the day. Ivanpah is the first large-scale solar thermal plant to be built in California in 20 years, supporting California's goal of 33% renewable power generation by 2020. And it also provides a, a boost to the local economy by creating 2,650 construction jobs at its peak and 86 operations and maintenance jobs ongoing. And it also supports 76 supply chain jobs across 17 states. So this isn't chopped liver. No, no, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. It's got a higher capacity factor than solar PVs would have. So it's, it's producing, it's, it's producing a, a greater percentage of the amount of power that you would expect out of, uh, you know, a, a, a greater percentage of the nameplate capacity. But it also produces power when the, when the sun is down. And this is, this is hundreds of megawatts. Yeah. So it is, it's the equivalent of a, of a pretty good sized, uh, you know, power plant. Not the equivalent of a good sized nuclear power plant by any stretch of the imagination, but it's, it's, uh, maybe a tenth or a, or a fifth even of a nuclear power plant. I forgot the numbers already. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's I don't 345 want to megawatts. To find them, but yeah. No, it's not as big as a nuclear plant, but it is very significant. Yeah. I, I wanted to tell you the story of my ex-wife's brother who came home from fourth grade with a note that said, this boy is retarded. He should be or mildly retarded. He should be in a special classroom. And the next year, he came back with another note from a different teacher, which said, this boy is not at all retarded. He's got a problem, which is that he's a genius. <laughs> and That can happen. It can happen. And he dropped out of high school partway through his senior year mm -hmm. because he found out that he couldn't graduate because his reading uh, skills were too low and he wouldn't be able to. He had an argument with an English teacher who said, there's no way you're going to pass this course. Mm -hmm. So he dropped out, and the first thing that he did was he st started spending all his time reading. Mm -hmm. And he got his GED two weeks before his class graduated. Mm -hmm. And then he got a job as a, as, a, as a guy who pumped gas in a gas station, because in New Jersey, you couldn't do it yourself. Yeah, right. You and, still can't. Yeah. And then the gas station uh, owner 
realized that he he was a fairly bright kid, so he started teaching him things like how to repair automatic transmissions and things like that. Well, after a little while, Alex decided that he needed more than this. So he, he started looking around, and he found that there was a local machine shop that he could go to, and they, they, they did specialty work where they were repairing machines in machine shops. Mm -hmm. And within two years, he was flying up and down the East Coast <laughs> repairing the most bizarre equipment that you could possibly imagine. Well, one thing that he did, he was living in New Jersey, he went to a, a lab at AT&T Bell Labs to do a repair there. And he met this guy um, who, was a, who was a head of a project at AT&T Bell Labs who looked at him and said, you know, you're too bright to be just a mechanic. Uh, why don't you go to college? And so the guy's name was Stephen. So he, 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 you know, Stephen told him to go. He, why don't you go to the county college? You can go there for a small, a low price. So he went to the county college and he got an, uh, an associate degree in engineering. This is the retired, retarded kid. Yeah. And he came back to Stephen, who said, um, "You know, maybe, maybe you should go to Rutgers." And so he went to Rutgers, graduated number two in his class, went back to Stephen, and um, Stephen said. Um, why don't you try going to Fermi Labs, get a master's degree? So he went to Fermi Labs. When he was done there, he went back to Stephen, who said, you know, I could hire you. <laughs> and sometime after that, I said, Alex, what do you do there? He said, well, what we're doing right now is we take a bell jar and we evacuate it. It's a really high vacuum. We, we cool down a, a bunch of atoms in there to a point where they're about a degree above absolute zero. And we have lasers pointing at them. And we, we, the lasers, lasers interfere with each other. And we trap. They make wells where the, where the, you know, the, the interference pattern. There's, there, and, and we can trap sodium atoms in there. And... and um, we get them all trapped in there, and then we shut everything off, and we watch them bounce. <laughs> and I said, that is the most useless thing I've ever heard of. And he said, no, you don't understand. If we can do this with sodium atoms today, if we can do it with hundreds of sodium atoms today, 20 years from now, we'll be doing it with thousands of hydrogen atoms. Mm -hmm. If we can do it with $40,000 lasers today, 20 years from now we'll be doing it with diode lasers that cost 60 cents each. Mm -hmm. If we can, you know, and he went through this, if, mm -hmm. we can, if we can hold them, 20 years from now we're going to be able to change the, the, the way that light approaches each other and that will get those wells to be smaller and smaller and smaller and each well will have a bunch of hydrogen atoms in it and when that happens, maybe, just maybe, they'll fuse. And if that works, then the day will come when you walk into the local hardware store and you say, I want one of those, and they sell you a container that looks like a grapefruit can, and it costs $2,000 or whatever it costs, and you take it home and you plug it in where your electric meter is, and you pour a pint of water in, and you're good for the next thousand years. <laughs> <laughs> well, interestingly enough, the Stephen guy, his name was Stephen Shu, mm -hmm. and he... And Alex and a few other guys wrote an article. I don't know what it was about, but it won a Nobel Prize. And then <laughs> Stephen Shu became the, the Secretary of Energy. And Alex went on and founded a business, and which now employs 100 people, this retarded kid from, from fourth grade. You know, He was working on this 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's a long-term project. It has, but the, the thing that's interesting about it is every time you put a little bit more effort into it, you learn more. Mm -hmm. And as you learn more and more and more, the solutions to the problems appear. And that, that not a promise, but the hope of having a way of powering a house that involves a generator in something the size of a grapefruit can that uses water as fuel mm -hmm. is nonetheless real. Well, I can believe it. I mean, that's, and that's so, the ultimate goal of fusion. It is fusion. It is fusion. And, of and course, this is exactly what my friend down in Princeton was talking about. Yeah, exactly. You learn these things step by step. That, and, that yeah. It takes time and it can't be accelerated. That's right. And the fact that it's taken 40 years and we still haven't got to the point where we have that grapefruit can is really kind of irrelevant in a way. Yeah. And it's irrelevant in a, in a couple of different ways. In one way, it's irrelevant because this is what we have to do in order to get the job done.
We have to just keep plugging along. Maybe we'll never do it, and it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. because it doesn't take a huge amount of our, of our resources to do mm -hmm. that. Maybe we will do it, and if we do, then we get something that might be really valuable. But the other thing, too, is it, it doesn't matter for another reason, and that is <clears throat> we've got all the technology we need already to deal with the problems that we've got. We can overcome global warming. We can overcome the... A sixth of the world's population that has no electrical, we can give them electricity if they want it. We can overcome a lot of problems and in the course of doing that we can also produce local jobs in local economies that are healthy, make the environment better, reduce global warming problems, and come out of this in, in a way that, that as I said, I think a hundred years from now people will be healthier and happier than they are today. All of this is possible. We have to develop the will to make it happen. Well, I think the will will happen. Yeah. yeah, this is why these things that we've been talking about, the finances are going to favor it. Eventually, yes. If there's money to be made, people are going to jump in. Yeah. Here it is. Here I, it think, is. I, think that's what it's, I think that's what's going to happen. People are going to realize that there's a lot of money to be saved and a lot of money to be made doing an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. Oh, how horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, an honest day's work doesn't have to be hard. No, it doesn't. And as I said, in this case, I think it might be fun. I think we're pulling on to the end of our second hour. Well, I think we've passed to the end of our second hour. Well, I hope they, I hope they include all this stuff because it's fun. They might. They will, well, I no, guess. There's for the, no time limit on the second. Part that's of right. Thing, yeah. You know? Well, you know, again, they could they could easily take the second half of this and make it they into make a it into program. The show. They did with the with yeah. that one. That, yeah, I got your note. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Well, okay. I guess uh, we're done for the day. Uh, so we'll say goodbye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>